This is New Zealand, Aotearoa. We are blessed with majestic mountains, beautiful forests, rivers, and a spectacular wild coastline, all 19,000 kilometres of it. I'm Craig Potton, and like many New Zealanders, I actually learnt to swim not long after I could walk. I'm a photographer, a conservationist, and a surfer, and I just love the coast. I like exploring above it and in the water. On my coastal journeys, I'll encounter some wonderful sea creatures. I'll visit people that care for the coast, and I'll try to understand its place in our culture and our duty of care for it. I'm standing on the North Island side of Cook Strait, our Great Divide, the narrow strip of water which separates the north from the south. To the east, the Great Pacific Ocean, to the west, the Tasman Sea. This is Cook Strait at its absolute wildest, a huge southerly storm, massive waves rolling in. I mean, the energy out there is extraordinary. Yet just over these waters lie the deep, tranquil, flooded valleys of the Marlborough Sounds. Geological wonders where the end of the Southern Alps sag into the sea, creating marvellous habitats for wild birds and fish. On both sides of the strait, I'll revisit haunts and friends of my youth. And I'll witness a piece of endearing history come back to life. We'll start on the shores of Cook Strait near Wellington and travel round its edge to the southernmost tip of the North Island. Then it's across the strait to Nelson, then to the turbulent waters of French Pass, and finally we'll end our journey in the quiet reaches of the Marlborough Sounds. This is Wellington's Eastbourne Beach on a beautiful calm day. You might think this pebble came, well, just from the Hutt River over there. In fact, like all our dynamic coastline, it was pulled here by strong currents. In this case, from around the east coast there, the Rangaranga Mountains delivered this pebble through those strong Cook Strait currents to this very beach. And that sort of wild weather and very tumultuous coast that we have, that's what led out here at Barrett's Reef to one of the worst maritime disasters ever in New Zealand's history. On the 10th of April, 1968, the inter-island ferry Wahini sailed from Littleton to Wellington. It hit the reef during a huge storm created by a cyclone from the north, creating big seas and gale force winds from the south. 733 people were on board, 51 died. Most of the survivors were washed ashore at Eastbourne. The Wahini storm showed just how treacherous the weather and waters of Cook Strait can be. A combination of violent currents and a massive storm demonstrated how weak humans can be when faced with the power of nature on this part of our coastline. Cook Strait, just 22 kilometres wide at its narrowest point, links the Tasman Sea to the Pacific Ocean. At each tide, the waters pour through it like a huge, fast-flowing river. But the tides around New Zealand work in such a way that the sea level can be a metre higher on one side of the country to the other. And that means when the water rushes through the strait on each tide, it's always running downhill. However, it's the floor of the strait that adds to its complex behaviour. Cook Strait to me is one of the great straits of the world because it mixes massive amounts of energy, you know, in terms of tides and currents. NIWA scientist Craig Stevens has been part of a team studying what goes on under the waters of the strait. And what they found was a vast canyon. It took years to map the canyon, and it's this that largely makes Cook Strait what it is and behave the way it does. So this is Cook Strait Canyon. 
an imagery of it. I mean, this is incredible. Can we stop somewhere around here and just have a look? How high between the tops and the bottom of these canyons, underwater canyons? Well, well this canyon system is around a kilometre. It's of the scale of the Grand Canyon. And that's why people from around the world get excited about some of the ocean processes that go on here. The current must... Where does it come from? And there's only so much water up there, and then suddenly there needs to be a whole lot more water here. Lots of canyon systems in other parts of the world, they don't have the strait sitting at its boundary, it's, it's a normal coast. And so you've got this, this tidal engine pushing and pulling water through right at the head of this canyon, rather than all being flowing downstream, if you like. For half of the, half the tide, you're actually sucking the water back up the canyon. Ah, so it's a river that goes up half the time and a river that flows down the other yeah, half, depending yeah. on the tide. There's really strong flows that Cook Strait is famous for. That's actually all up in there. So that's the shallowest and the narrowest bit. It's where things get squeezed through. And so the waves basically get stacked up by the tidal flow. And so you get a sort of tumultuous wave breaking and sort of waves going in all sorts of directions and really quite steep. This is Red Rocks on Wellington's southern coast. It was here in 1985 that Rose Keating experienced the unforgiving force of the Straits Currents. She had just completed a diving course and was on her second diving trip when she was swept out into the Strait. We'd gone out as far as we wanted to go and we were going to head back to shore. Then, I don't know quite what happened, but I just kind of got buffeted to the surface. And. You were going away from shore. We kind of know this now, don't we? Yes, I was going away from shore quite rapidly. The wind, tides and local currents are all difficult to predict here. A person lost in the sea can be swept away fast, making searches very difficult. It's not a position I'd like to be in, but, but we do work with um, things called uh, Lagrangian drifters. And so these are things that ping out GPS position and, and so they can <clears throat> simulate the, the track someone lost would take. But um, one of the challenges is actually factoring in the effect of the wind on the, the part that's sticking out above the surface. We've released maybe 10 or 12 drifters off the south end of Kapiti Island. This was an experiment a few years ago. And uh, eight of them did what we thought. Um, and two of them uh, shot off in completely different directions. And so that shows the challenge for sort of search and rescue. If someone's gone in the water, um, they can, there's quite an envelope where they can end up. One stage I saw a little boat and I could see a helicopter flying up and down, up and down the, um, the coastline here. But I was way out in Cook Strait and I knew they'd never see me. So you kept on drifting out, time was going by? Yes, yep, I would see the ferries and the first ferry was, first time I saw a ferry it was, I was in between the land and the ferry and the next ferry I saw it was in between me and the land, so I knew, yeah, I knew I was heading out a fair way into Cook Strait. The tide and the wind had dragged Rose out, away from her searches, toward the middle of the strait. So you look out, there's a ferry out there now. You were that far out the second time beyond that? Yep. I knew that it was up to me, basically. I had to get myself in. I had to stay together and I had to get myself in some kind of way, shape or form. Rose spent the whole night drifting in the strait in very cold waters. It is estimated she drifted 20 kilometres during the night past the entrance to Wellington Harbour. And then one of the quirks of Cook Strait happened. A big southerly wind sprang up. Because her wetsuit was so buoyant, she was floating on the surface, and the wind caught her and pushed her inshore. At daylight, after 18 hours in the strait, she was washed up on Lyle Bay close to where she started. I was pretty happy to be on land, but I, I just wanted to have something to eat, something nice and warm to drink, go and sleep. Hey, when you look back now, um, you were exceedingly lucky, weren't you? Yes, I was. I was very lucky. This is Cape Palliser on the Wairarapa coast, the southernmost point of the North Island. It's a rugged coastline, a long way from anywhere. It seems a bleak and unforgiving place, but the locals thrive on it. A colony of fur seals has set up residence just under Cape Palliser. 
This is really neat. Seals are land animals that have returned to the sea. So these little guys, they've got to learn to swim. And we're better than in preschool here. Mum is out the back watching and they're learning to swim amongst themselves. Sometimes they're called puppies or dogs of the sea, seals, and you can see why. They're inquisitive like little dogs. I mean, what a neat little guy. He's coming back to the North Island, having not been here for over 100 years. They've started breeding again. And this is where it all begins, at preschool. It's also popular with surfers. I knew it as one of the surfing spots back in the 1960s. Back in 69, I came to the coast here to surf out here. We put our tent up, had a fire at night. It was a gravel road back then, but not much else has changed. They're still surfing. Then I went round the coast a little bit further, and there's this extraordinary village. Every boat there had a bulldozer. They're still here. It's like a bulldozer convention, all shapes, sizes and colours. They are part of an unusual community which exists mainly because of the fish life in the strait. It's the village of Nawi, tucked into a bay just five kilometres from Cape Palliser, the North Island's most southerly point. It sits largely unprotected from the southerly storms that batter the strait. There's no wharf and little protection from the elements, and when the fishing fleet comes in, they say they all need to come in at the same time. And you can only do that if you have your own bulldozer. Uh, 37. Oh, OK. Sure. Garth Gadsby was a cray fisherman operating out of Nawi. When he first came here, there were less boats fishing out of the village. But you came here when? Uh, 1991. Garth's retired yeah, these days. Yeah. His son now operates five his boat. Years. It's a long five years. What drove the fishermen here in the first place? Was it just crayfish? There was a few batches here that were for weekends only, and they came out and went fishing and, uh, for groper and blue cod and then crayfish, and then they started up the commercial industry here. And these bordos, I mean, they're just there with salt air and rain and everything coming in on them. Rust must be a massive problem. Yeah, the maintenance on them's pretty high because uh, they sit on the beach 24-7, so, you yeah, know, it's not, it's not good on them. But you give them a lick of paint. I mean, you've given yours a lick of pink paint. Is there something? Well, I guess we get the coat every couple of years. It's, uh, it doesn't last that long. So who actually chose this very gaudy pink? Oh, my wife. <laughs> <laughs> it's a simple operation to launch the boats from the beach. But it's a novel experience for anyone, myself included, as we head along the coast that has played such a large part in Garth Gadsby's life. Over time, Garth has witnessed the local fishing scene change dramatically. Fish numbers are down and boats have to head further afield to get a decent catch. People used to feed themselves by harpocker off the beach here, I. They did in the early days, yeah, but it's not so much now. We still get them, but uh, they're out deeper now, not like they used to be in the old days. They could get, you get the likes of Lake Ferry, they used to catch them with the set line straight off and surf casters off the beach. They cut harpoku from a, a set line? Yep. That's unheard of these yeah. days. I mean, we're pretty crazy as humans, the way we fish places out, aren't we, really? But we, we do, yeah. yeah, yeah. But uh, just technology's made a difference, you know, like every man has got a GPS these days, and if you're out in one of your favourite fishing spots and someone goes past and they just, they ping you with the GPS, and next time you go back, there's three or four boats there. So it's, we've sort of ruined it for ourselves, you know. The underwater native forests are similar and as important as those on the land, yet virtually unknown and unrecognised by most people. Most of us have memories of those magical rock pools of our childhood and the seaweed in them. I have to admit, even though I've loved them since a kid, I don't know all the names like I know in a forest. I don't know many things, but I, I understand that that pink turf there is actually a... Well, it's a seaweed, is it? That's right. Well, there's two different things here. 
that's more like the turf. But these are crustose ones. So they're actually red seaweeds mm -hmm. that have calcium carbonate, they're rock hard, and there's different species growing like a mosaic. Is it power eat graze on these? Well, they graze on the surface, but what's more important is that these seaweeds release a certain compound, and power live part of their life as larvae. And they get the signal to settle down and grow a shell and become adults because of the compound that these seaweeds release. So they release a chemical, the power larvae think, oh, this is a good place to live, and will settle on that surface and grow a shell. It's so, very important. And I mean, being plants, they release oxygen. Being animals, we breathe oxygen. Absolutely. Take two breaths, Craig. Right. The first breath is you can thank the land plants, right. but for your second breath, you have to thank algae, because algae produce 50% of the world's oxygen. Algae, these simple plants yes. are producing 50% of all the air that I breathe, the yes. oxygen. And that includes algae that are floating in the ocean and the seaweeds around our coasts. Who'd have thought such unassuming plants as seaweed could play such an important part in our daily life? It's time we honoured them and made a few national parks just for seaweed. This coastline is home to another wonder of nature. The harsh elements faced by the people of Nawi have helped create one of the country's more unique landforms, the Putangirua rocks or pinnacles. This combination of rock and erosion formation is known as badlands, and these are one of New Zealand's best examples. The pinnacles have been forming over the past 125,000 years. The wind and rain which lash the edges of the strait have gradually carved these ancient gravel deposits into these spectacular pinnacles. I think this is a really good place to take a photograph from, of these very tall parallel spires. I love the textures here. They're quite repetitive in a way, but that I think works really well. It makes quite a, what I think, sophisticated, full frame, full composition image. And I'm pretty happy with the shot I've got right now. Now I've travelled across the strait and into the quiet backwaters of my hometown, Nelson. Like a lot of Kiwis, I was born very close to the ocean. In fact, I've lived on this hillside all of my life. Five different houses, but the same view out to the ocean. And down there, that's Tahuna Beach. Ever since I was a kid, I've taken the family dog and then my own dog for a walk after school just to get away from it. That's the start of wilderness for me. And out here, the boulder bank, a magnificent place. I started surfing out there. The first surf I ever had was out in the boulder bank. I guess the ocean's been in me all my life. Nelson's boulder bank is one of the wonders of nature. A 13 kilometre natural breakwater protecting Nelson Harbour from Tasman Bay. It's around 6,000 years old. The boulders come from Mackay's Bluff at the northern end of the bank. Over thousands of years, boulders have fallen off the bluff and then literally been tumbled along by ocean currents. Mike Johnston, like me, is a born and bred Nelsonian. He's also a geologist and has a vast knowledge of the boulder bank and how it was created. For every big boulder you see out there, there's a whole lot of little ones that have moved along as well. And the little ones tend to raft the big boulders along and then they lock into place. So today, Mike, there's quite a swell coming in. I guess that's a good day for showing the process. Yes, yes, that actually uh, demonstrates very graphically how these smaller boulders move along the bank because the waves are coming in at an angle. So what it, the waves do when a strong wave, they pick the boulder up on an angle, dump it on the back, and then the backwash brings it down like that, and this moves the material along. So it's an internationally recognised site. Now, why do we put a value on it? Well, to my knowledge, there's nothing like it anywhere else in the world, so it is literally unique. And there's uh, quite a large number of geological factors as to why that is so. Here at Mackey's Bluff, we have a rock which is a type of uh, granite, and it's got very few planes of weakness, and it, when the blocks fall into the sea, then they essentially the block stays in place, but just gets the edges taken off it, and they go from uh, being angular to rounded. 
the boulder bank is a true oddity of nature and strangely compelling. I love the subtle colours of the grey rocks, burnt ochre, yellow lichen and contrasting bright green plants. I can lose myself in the small worlds at my feet with my camera, making compositions of a world more ordered than I could ever make. Up the coast from Nelson and the Boulder Bank, over the hills from Mackay's Bluff, lies an isolated, quiet piece of coastline that played a huge and largely forgotten part in New Zealand's communication history. In the early days, settlers had to wait many months just to connect with the homeland. That was England. But in 1876, that all changed when a cable was laid from Australia down to this point right here. It was an awe-inspiring feat of communication technology. The cable ran from England to Sydney, Sydney Harbour to Cable Bay, nearly 16,000 miles of it. The telegraph opened for brisk public business on Monday, the 21st of February, 1876. 54 telegrams received, 93 cent. The following day, the first cable news from Britain was published in the local paper, the Nelson Mail. The cable at this bay had joined New Zealand to the world. Barbara Stewart and her husband run Cable Bay Farm. Just up from the beach and below the farm is the last remnant of the original cable. So this is the original cable? Yes. And this came ashore in 1876. Mm -hmm. What was it like on the day, do you know? It was apparently, it was a wonderful day. It was calm and a bit of a chop out on the sea. And uh, Hemi Matanga, the local Maori chief, came down and he was one of the first in the water, pulled it ashore. He pulled this cable ashore? He did. Symbolically, he must have had other people helping him. There that was must a... have weighed a tonne. Business in the South Island, especially Dunedin, was booming in the late 1800s, and Cable Bay and its settlement became the conduit out of New Zealand to the rest of the world. How long was this the method of communication with Australia and back to England? Well, the, the cable arrived here in February of... 1876, and the cable station ran right through till uh, 1914 when the, the telegraph room was burned down, and they managed to keep it going for another three years, and it closed eventually in 1917. That year, the cable was rerouted to Titahi Bay. So it's these tranquil Cable Bay waters that hold a special place in the history of New Zealand. And it was here at Cable Bay that a little of my personal history occurred. It was here that I first put on a face mask, a snorkel and flippers and went out into the world of fish, looked under the water and saw what a marvellous place it is down there. And what I saw in that magical underwater world got me thinking about fish. They're social creatures, intelligent, some mate for life and even grieve when they lose their mates. But we don't treat them like our native land animals, something that irked me. So with a few mates from the Forest and Bird Society, after a long fight, we created a reserve south of Cable Bay, running right through to the Boulder Bank. It took us 15 years to do it, and it's one of the better things I've done in my lifetime. And so a beautiful part of the coast, which plays such an important part of my life, helped to lead me down the path I've now taken in conservation and recreation. The Marlborough Sounds are on the south side of Cook Strait. It's here the Southern Alps, the backbone of the South Island, dip down under the sea, creating vast drowned valleys. The Sounds make up one-fifth of New Zealand's whole coastline. They're a safe haven from the wild waters of the Strait. Today I'm heading to French Pass and Derville Island. I'm on the steep ridge line leading into French Pass. That's Derville Island over there, and that's the pass below. The channel is only 100 metres across at its narrowest point. Here the water races through on each tide at such a speed that it can stun fish, creating whirlpools, eddies and currents. An awe-inspiring passage, feared and respected by mariners. Wild coast. I mean, look at these currents. It's mesmerising, these whirlpools. It's about as wild as it gets. 
Uh, yeah, but you could see them yesterday. A man who's navigated these waters for 20 years is an old friend, Danny Bolton. No one knows this place better. Its behaviour, its treasures, its dangers and its idiosyncrasies. Even after all his time here, Danny still has a lot of respect for the power and the energy generated by the currents of French Pass. Fantastic energy in that here, Craig. Uh, this current here runs through at around six knots, comes down, drops into a hole there that's around 70 metres. You can see here the upwelling at the back. Yeah. And as it's going down, the water's pushing back up. It's actually like a wall of water up there and another wall down here. It was almost yeah. like, you know, going through a river or something, like we were going downhill. Is that right or yeah, it just no, feel like it? No, it is. No, you, you do physically go downhill. Yeah, it would be interesting to take a measurement from 100 metres that side and 100 metres that side and just see what the drop was. When the tide's coming in, the tide runs this way, and when it's going out, it changes and goes back the other way. I, I actually, my feeling is that the tide here doesn't take a breath. Today, French Pass is used by boats of all sizes to avoid having to sail the 30 kilometres around the island. French Pass was named in recognition of the first European to sail through the pass. In January of 1827, French explorer Dumont de Ville took on the daunting waterway with only sail power to take him through. He'd spent three days studying the perilous currents. He made it, but only after a few spins and hitting a rock. Those three days, you know, he took his long boats out. I, I would say that he would have, I mean, he was, a, he was a, an excellent navigator and he would have had a look around and checked the reef. He went up on a nearby hill, which is probably the hill here behind us, and looking, looked down onto the channel, decided it could be navigated if great precaution were taken. So he would have worked out that he could have taken his boat through. He wouldn't have been risking anything. Hey, wait a minute, he hit a rock. Well, he did, yeah, but uh, not intentionally. <laughs> Oh, you old sailors, you're all the same. You get a feeling for what Deville and his crew must have gone through when you cut the power and let the boat just flow through these turbulent waters. Navigators who seem to have no trouble negotiating the channel's waters are the dolphins and the orcas. Danny has filmed them as they cruise through the waterway, oblivious to the dangers that put humans at risk. Over the years, Danny's seen the explosion of mussel farms in the sounds and watched the effect they have on the local environment. He fears that whole life chains are being broken down by too much aquaculture. The dolphins come in here, they bait ball, uh, work pilchards and that to the surface, and uh, they cooperatively feed, working in pods of around six to eight dolphins. Dolphins round up fish into a ball and drive them to the surface, where the gannets are waiting to share the catch. But aquaculture ropes get in the way of that roundup. Now that has a huge uh, flow on effect with the seabirds. Gannets uh, can dive to 10 metres. During the winter, it's interesting to note that pilchards lie deep in the water column. So if there wasn't a predator lifting those pilchards to the surface, it wouldn't, they wouldn't come into the range of the gannets that are diving. There's another major effect created by the mussel farms. They create tonnes of waste, turning the sea floor into an underwater desert. With the frantic activity of chasing fish, Dolphins churn up the sand, causing a blinding underwater desert storm, which in itself creates major problems. Here in this area, we've got one of the rarest seabirds in the world, which is the king shag. Now, shags are eye hunters, so it actually needs to be able to track its fish and to see it in order to take it. So where we get aquaculture or mussel farms going over king shag feeding areas, then that's putting a stressor on those birds. There is a place for aquaculture, but it needs careful management and to be confined to limited areas. Derville Island is famous for its special rock, called argillite. Local Māori used to supply the whole of New Zealand with materials for tool making, transporting canoe loads of the rock through those vicious currents. Rowing to the island brings back memories of my childhood days spent here holidaying with my family. Hi, Ross. 
Ross Kaufaru remembers my dad boating in these waters. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Hi. Hey, Craig, good to see you guys. Yeah, good. You want a rubber? Back in the old days, there would have been just a flurry of activity. Can you imagine what it was like just at a place like this? Yes, I can. I can imagine all the canoes pulled up on the on the Ohana mm. Beach, and uh, they'd be they'd be coming over here to to collect the argillite and uh, and take it up north where they used to barter. They'd uh, get food for for argillite and that sort of thing. Yeah, and I guess some of these flakes here we've we've got come off this mother rock here, um, and I guess they also beat it with a big bit of granite or something to flake yes, them off. but wherever you go here, yep. you'll find um, hammer stones and that, they'll be just lying in different places, you know, up in the scrub and all, right. all over the place. It's rocks like these on Derville Island and a few just behind Nelson that were the absolute industrial heart of Maori culture. It was from those rocks that they got the argillite they made blank adzes that travelled throughout New Zealand that were transported as far as Invercargill and to Northland. And we can tell that because of these chips that are still here today. That was the way they fashioned the blanks down so that they could transport them. And you can imagine, probably forms a little bit more work than that, that would have been put in packs, carried down to the coast. Straight away, they had to go through French Pass or right around Derville Island and out through Stevens Passage. Rough travel on the coast, but delivering a totally prized possession. And so the industrial hub of early Maori culture is no more. And for Danny Bolton, there's a fear that what we have lost to the land could be repeated under the water. Part of what makes this area so wonderful could be lost to future generations. Yeah, underwater is, you know, I'm quite conscious of it being out of sight, out of mind, really. You know, there's, there's all sorts of things happening down there. It's just, it's just a whole different world. It's yeah, amazing. I think we've treated fish quite poorly compared to the way we treat our native birds. I mean, they are native of New Zealand in exactly the same way. We don't think of them as treasures. Why not? Um, I think we've probably been brought up with a hunter fishing mentality and truthfulness. You know, that, that's where I was. What we've done to the land, we're now doing to the sea. And the thing is that we really don't appreciate um, the, the implications of that. And when we lose the ocean, we go with it. From on high, the vast drowned valleys of the Marlborough Sounds are obvious. This is Mount Stokes at just over 1,200 metres, the highest point in the Sounds. Up here you will find flora and fauna common to the rest of the Southern Alps. Kyle Bland is a geologist who has studied the history of the Southern Alps and the forces that created this gigantic landform. Kyle, I I mean, I feel as I'm in my southern Alps here. We've got mountain plants, we've got what look like mountain rocks and lichens, and but there's the ocean down there. What's happened to the southern Alps here? Well, you're sort of right in that we are sitting up here on top of a mountain. Um, but the usual thing that you sort of expect to see once you're on top of a mountain is a river valley down below. But this is one of the most interesting and one of the most spectacular parts of New Zealand's coastline. And what was once a series of mountain ranges and fantastic river valleys has now been drowned by the ocean, giving us the Marlborough Sounds. How did it happen? Why well, did the Southern Alps fall into the sea? I'm not sure if there's really a convincing answer for exactly why it's happened. But probably the most likely one is all due to the big tectonic forces that have produced a lot of the landforms of New Zealand. So off eastern North Island, we have Pacific Plate. It's a big chunk of ocean plate which is being subducted, it's sliding underneath the main part of the North Island, the Australian plate, and as it's sliding down, there's a bit of friction, there's a bit of stickiness under the area offshore from Wanganui, the Kapiti Coast, and that friction just is able to drag the coast down and the crust down. And this is a real sort of pinch point in tectonics and the way that New Zealand works. Uh, off the coast of North Island, we have oceanic crust. That tends to be quite dense, so it wants to sink. The North Island itself sits generally on continental crust, which is lighter, so it wants to float. So hence we've got subduction. And because of that, the ocean has been able to move into the river valleys, or once, what, once were river valleys. I mean, New Zealand's coast is very dynamic, isn't it? 
it is New Zealand's coastline is always changing. The mountains are growing at a huge rate. We sit in the middle of a big ocean. We've got a lot of westerly winds and we've got the winds up on top of us here today. And that brings a lot of moisture. You can see that with the cloud here and that wind, that moisture, um, coupled with in places fairly soft rock, lots of uplift gives us lots of erosion, which means the whole landscape's always changing. And all that sediment gets carried down our rivers, out to our coasts, which means our coasts are always changing. These sea-filled valleys below us have provided a haven to one of the world's most famous mariners. I'm with the Department of Conservation's Roy Gross. We're heading for Ship Cove. This was Captain Cook's favourite anchorage in New Zealand. Yeah, great place to work, huh? Yeah, no, it's fantastic, Craig. There's um, never a dull moment. There's plenty to do, and um, it's quite a complex area to manage, so you're, you're doing a variety of things in any one day. The last time I spent a lot of time in the Sounds, 20 years ago, there was a lot more, um, lot more farm and probably more emphasis on forestry, but things have changed a bit, haven't they? Oh, they have. There's been a, ge a general moving by people, everyone from batch owners to large landowners, to now let what were farms revert back. And some of them are doing it for carbon credits and, and good on them. So they're achieving native vegetation values, improving the habitat, for their various native flora and fauna, and at the same time, they're giving something back as well. The Department of Conservation has put in a huge amount of restoration work around the sounds, bringing native birds and the original vegetation back to the islands. We've made a particular drive in our management to make sure that we showcase some of these islands. We don't lock them up, and sure there's a risk, but as long as you make sure that those islands that are that precious that you're going to, uh, that are of national significance, then you have to make that hard call and say, I'm sorry, public can't go on there, it's too much risk, but we'll offer all these other alternatives. We're at Ship Cove. This is where Captain Cook spent 170 days over three voyages. That was longer than he spent anywhere else in the world apart from his hometown Whitby. It was good provisions, a good place for the crew to take a rest and a good place to get ready for further journeys. Roy and Glenis Payne worked together in bringing the story of Ship Cove and its significance to life. Both have a good knowledge of those first meetings of the two cultures. Ship Cove has got to be the, one of the most significant places in New Zealand's history for the meeting of two cultures. You had Cook from, sailed from the other side of the world and met up with the indigenous people who welcomed them here and indeed helped look after them. They traded, they bartered. This must have been, as the whole sounds was, a bit of a food basket. I mean, Cook provisioned, reprovisioned here, but. Māori have been provisioning here for some hundreds of years before that, hadn't they? And we see the weka around here today, which is wonderful. Yeah. Well, it was sort of a jump-off point for, for us. I mean, my whānau um, have been here particularly for hundreds of years, but it was a place where people rested before they went across the strait to the North Island or to Kapiti, and vice versa when they're coming this way. It was sort of more a transiting place, a um, place to barter and, and trade. Yeah, and just to take stock, sit down, have a rest before you moved on. The linking of the two cultures is reflected in a bridge that straddles the river that provided Cook and his crew with fresh water. One end of the bridge has Maori carvings, the other a European ship's rigging. But Cook's instructions were to claim the land for Britain, and on Wednesday, the 31st of January, 1770, he sailed across to the adjoining island, Motuara, to raise the flag and take possession of the South Island for King George III. Today, on this last leg of our journey, we're travelling across to the island to hopefully witness something very different. As they sat at anchor in the sounds, Cook's naturalist Joseph Banks was listening to the sound of the island bird song. He felt compelled to record this in his journal. This morning, I was awakened by the singing of the birds. Their voices were certainly the most melodious wild music I've ever heard. 
almost imitating small bells, but the most tunable silver sound imaginable. So it's regenerating really well, isn't it? For 10 years, the Department of Conservation has been trying to recreate that piece of history, clearing away stoats, cats and rats, and bit by bit bringing back the birds, which Banks and local Māori would have heard. Bill Cash from the Department of Conservation has been heavily involved in the project and the two of us are overnighting on Motuara to see if we can share the wonder experienced by Banks. So why, why do they actually do it? I mean, has anyone figured that one out? I mean, we all know that birds sing in the morning and the evening more than they do during the day or at night. I think it's because they all sleep in separate little roosts and they get up and sort of sing and talk to their mates, basically, I think. It's the morning chatter. like a, the morning cup of tea and they... Sort of announcing that the world's... Announcing to the world yeah. that, yeah. They're here and the, and the day's begun. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. But even as night falls, it's obvious sleep might be a problem. But like, what are those noises that we're hearing? Little blue penguins, they're just coming ashore. Yeah? How many, how many come up? Well, I think there's about a couple of hundred pair on the island. Oh. And right at dusk, they come ashore and they'll sit there and talk all night. If you, I can't talk all night though. After all, I want to be up to hear that morning bird song. spectacular to have the dawn chorus back and it's almost as loud probably as when Banks was here. I'm so heartened to see what has happened here on this island with this project. Can we learn to feel the same way about our fish and our underwater life and love and protect them as we love and protect our birds? I hope we can and while there is still time, 